And we want to take you back now to former President Trump's press conference, where he is now taking questions from reporters. Let's listen in. What advice, if any, you're giving him about a ceasefire, about ending the yeah. war? The last time my son was at Mar-a-Lago, and he came with his wife and uh, a large group of people. And uh, we had a very good relationship with him and with Israel. Again, this would never have happened. October 7th would have never happened, would have never, ever happened. And uh, he asked for the meeting. We had the meeting. It was about two hours, two and a half hours long. And uh, I expect I might be talking to him, but I haven't since then. No. Did you encourage him not to take a ceasefire deal? Did you give him any advice no, about ending the war? Him. He knows what he's doing. I did encourage him to get this over with. You want to get it over with. It has to get over with fast. But uh, have victory, get your victory, and get it over with. It has to stop. The killing has to stop. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you, President Trump. You've spoken very passionately about how God saved your life. And I'm wondering, have you put much thought into why God saved your life? As in, for what purpose has he been shielding and protecting you? So... I don't know if you heard the question. You've spoken about God saving your life, that I've spoken passionately about it. And something happened, because that was a miracle. I never looked that way. The audience was massive, and it was in front of me. I never have the that particular graph. That was a graph on, as you all know now, that it's very, uh, I think everyone knows it very well, but it showed the great numbers on illegal immigration. It was the lowest point we've ever had. And it was one that I use less than 20 percent of the time. It's always at the end of the speech, not at the beginning of the speech. And it's always on the left side, not the right side. And yet, for some reason, I called it. I, it's not on a teleprompter. I do things largely without a teleprompter, frankly, because it's hard to hold an audience if you're going to go for an hour and a half or two hours reading, reading a script. And I just talked about it, and I moved to my right, turned sharply to my right, ping. And if I didn't do that, I'm not here with you. So, yeah, a God has something to do with it. It's, it's a miracle, and God had something to do with it. And maybe it's uh, we want to save the world. This world is going down. This world is going down. So it could be. But I believe that. I believe that my sons are very good shooters. They're, they're like uh, scratch golfers, better, relatively speaking, with shooters, great shooters. And Eric and Don both told me, I, from 130 yards, I said, well, that's pretty far away, isn't it? They said, no, that's like a one-foot putt with, you know, weapons like the one being used. Plus, he was a good shooter. This guy was a good shooter. He went to the range and shot a lot, and he was supposed to be a pretty good shooter. They said a bad shooter would hit the target almost 100 percent of the time. So uh, something happened. And I have to say, the uh, Secret Service sniper did an amazing job. He had five seconds to find the target. and hit the target, and he hit the target within, think of this, five seconds. And he was much further away because he was over here, and this other person was over there. So you have to give credit. And I have to also say about the Secret Service, when I was hit, I knew it because when I touched, there was blood pouring all over my hand. I said, I guess I know what that is. And I, went, I was going down for protection. And they were screaming, get down, get down. There was bullets. And uh, those Secret Service guys were, and person, Kate, they were on top of me in a matter of, I think, three seconds. It was time dead. And bullets were coming out. I would hear the bullet. I didn't realize you could hear it, but now I know very well uh, those bullets were going right over my head. They were there and very brave. There was nobody that said, I'm not going to be going there. They just, uh, they were there very quickly, and they were very brave. They were, and there were mistakes made, obviously. He shouldn't have been up there. The roof should have been uh, taken care of. And uh, there were mistakes made. There's no question about it. But uh, there was a lot of bravery also. We have to remember that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to talk about credit card debt for just yeah. a second. You've got all it these items. It's a record. It's a record. Credit card. Right, credit yeah, 48% card. 48% up. Um, yeah. And many families using, going into debt just to pay for groceries. Yeah. What's your message to Americans right now that you can make America affordable again? Well, I would say my debt. message to them, so he said, credit card debt is at the all-time high. It's never been like this. Watch your, what's your message to America? How are we going to solve that? And what will they do? You know what I think they should do? They should, on November 5th or sooner, if it's early voting, which... Largely, it is, which is ridiculous. We should have one-day voting, paper ballots. 
we should have voter ID and we should have proof of citizenship because people are voting and people are going on now without citizenship. But we should do it and maybe we'll be able to get that done too. It's one of the things I want to do. But my message to them would be very simple, vote for Trump and we're going to fix the problem. We're going to get it fixed. We'll get follow it fixed. Follow-up question. Yes, like, good. Kamala's been promising on day one, I'll do this. And for basically four years, she's promised this day one. Yeah. What will you do on day one to turn this country around? So she is saying when she gets in, she's in now. And especially with Biden, because, I mean, he's not in the best of shape. But you know what? She's in there now. She can do anything she wants. And she's still saying, if you elect me, I'll do this, I'll do... Why didn't she do it? Here's my one question, it's the easiest question, because she complains about everything, everything, everything. Why didn't she do it? That's the, all I ask. On day one, we're going to drill, baby, drill, and we're going to close the border, and we're going to let people come in, but they're going to come in leg legally. They're going to come into our country legally. But on day one, we're going to do many things. You know, I can do a lot of things at one time. But the question is often is, what's the first thing you're going to do? I would say we have a tie. We're going to close the border. We're not going to let, we're going to stop the millions of people coming in. And we're going to take all of the criminals that have come in. And we know every one of them, I know. And the local police know better than anybody else. They're going to work with us. I've spoken to a lot of the sheriffs, the incred every, every police, virtually every law enforcement group in America has endorsed Trump. I don't think anybody's endorsed Kamala. Not one. I don't think anybody's endorsed them. And you know that better than anybody. In Florida, in all over California, they've endorsed me. We have the relationship I have with law enforcement. And these are great people and people that we have to really cherish and respect and let them do their job and protect them. And you'll always have a bad apple in everything. You have bad apples as reporters. That I can tell you many. I'd say about 80 uh, percent. But you're always going to have bad apples. But you can have very, you have very, very few when you look at it. Very, very few. You have to let them do their job. You have to protect them. But basically, we're going to drill, baby, drill. We're going to get the energy prices down almost immediately. And we're going to close the border. And we're going to get the crooked ones out, the bad ones out. And we're going to let a lot of people come in. Because we need more people, especially with AI coming and all of the different things. And the farmers need, everybody needs. But we're going to make sure that they're not murderers, killers, drug dealers, and the kind of people that we have largely coming in right now. Okay. Mr. President, Mr. President, many of your allies who want you to win in November say your current strategy isn't working, that you need to stop with the personal attacks on Kamala Harris and deliver a more disciplined message. Do you agree? And also, you added more people to your campaign today. Yeah. Is that a sign of a shifting strategy? No, I think it's a sign of we want to close it out. We had... We have great people. Susie is fantastic, as you know, and Chris is fantastic. They're leading it. Uh, Corey Lewandowski is coming in. Uh, he'll be, you know, a uh, personal envoy, or he'll be at some at some level. Uh, they're going to be, you know, they're they're doing a great job. Look, we've taken with all of the abuse we've taken from the fake news media, all of this horrific abuse we take. And all I want to do is make the country good. All I want to do is have strong borders and good education. We want to have choice for education. So important. So many different things. You would think it would be the other way. We rebuilt the military. We did so many great things. But that's the way it's been for Republicans, and I guess more so for me than anybody in history. And that's okay. Because we're leading in the polls. For the most part, we're leading in the polls. We were leading Biden by a lot. We're leading now, but I think when she's exposed, I think we're going to beat her by a lot more than we would have beaten Biden by, because he had a little group of people that have been voting for him for a long time. She doesn't have that. People don't know who she is. Uh, as far as the personal attacks, her because of what she's done to the country. I'm very angry at her that she'd weaponized the justice system against me and other people. Very angry at her. Uh, I think I'm entitled to personal attacks. I don't have a lot of respect for her. I don't have a lot of respect for her intelligence. And I think she'll be a terrible president. And I think it's very important that we win. And whether the personal attacks are good, bad, I mean, she certainly attacks me personally. She actually called me weird. He's weird. It was just a sound bite. And she called J.D. and I weird. He's not weird. He was a great student at Yale. He went to Ohio State, graduated in two years at the top of his class. And all of these different things, and, and we have this guy that's running a failed, really a very failed state, who's ha had a terrible career. 
I mean, you have him saying they're weird. No, he's a weird guy. And she's weird in her policy. Who wouldn't want to have strong borders? Who doesn't want to have lower taxes? You know, all my life I've watched as politicians campaigned, and I've always been on, you know, for the most part, on the other side, on the side that these people are on. And they always talked about, we're going to reduce taxes. This is the only campaign I've ever heard where they're saying, we're going to increase your taxes. And then people say they're going to vote for him? I don't know. So I don't think so. I don't think people know who she is yet. When people, because really people didn't know. You can ask the man on the street. I saw it on one of the shows today. They asked the man on the street, what's the last name of Kamala? Nobody knew. It's Harris. Nobody knew the last name. I don't even use it because nobody knows who I'm talking about. People don't know who she is. She's a radical left socialist. But beyond that, I mean, she's way beyond socialism. Who's going to destroy our country? And when they find out, I think you're going to see something. But right now, even not knowing her, and with all of the, like the cover of Time magazine, they didn't put a picture. They got a great artist to do it. What was that all about? You know, what was that all about? The whole thing is crazy. I just want to win for the country. Uh, some people say, oh, why don't you be nice? But they're not nice to me. They want to put me in prison, you know, just so you understand. You know, they tell me I should be nice. They want to put me in prison. It's never happened before in the history of our country. I did nothing wrong. I have crooked judges. I have crooked prosecutors. And they're all Democrats, all Democrat areas, other than in Florida, where you had a brilliant judge who ruled in my favor. I won the case, the documents case, won it in its entirety. And Jack Smith, deranged Jack Smith, suffered a defeat. But in New York City, everything's clubhouse. Everything, I know it very well. I grew up there. I know it very well. And we have a very crooked system. And it's one of the reasons that New York is dying. Nobody wants to come in. No companies want to come in because the courtroom system is so corrupt both at a federal level and at a state level and a city level. And they put you into an area where you have 3% Republican vote. It's all a rigged deal, just like Fani, F-A-N-I, Fani, uh, with her boyfriend. And I think that's been discredited, too. They've been discredited. But think of it. They don't want me to be a little bit nasty. They want to put me in prison, me. They want to put me. It's never happened before in the history of our country. It's happened in third world countries, but it's never happened here. And they're in danger because you create a precedent for doing that. And once that happens, that's a, that's a really bad thing. You know, in, in the years before, and I've said this a few times, not too much, but uh, with Hillary, she was subpoenaed by Congress to give everything she's got, and she burned it. She acid washed it, bleach bit, they call it. She totally scrubbed it. And then they broke everything with hammers, with uh, fire. They burned it. And then she said, I don't have anything. Well, it turned out that she had a lot to give. And everybody said, lock her up, lock her up. And I used to go, easy, just easy, easy. Then we won. And I said, wouldn't it be terrible? And, and you know, I lose. Some people are upset when I did this. but. You have to look at it maybe differently now. I say, wouldn't it be terrible to put the wife of the president, former president of the United States, into a prison? Now, think of that. Hillary Clinton, she was secretary of state. She was the wife of a president of the United States, who used to be a friend of mine before I ran for, you know, for politics. He was a friend of mine. He used to play my golf course all the time. I have a great golf course right next to their home in Westchester. He used to be there all the time. It was his favorite course. But you know what? I could have done that very easily. She was so guilty. And I said to my people, wouldn't it be terrible to put, I don't know, wouldn't it be terrible to take, and we won the election, wouldn't it be terrible to take a former Secretary of State who was the wife of the President of the United States and put her into a prison? But that's what they want to do with me. And I did nothing wrong. It's all crooked politics and really crooked judges. You know I have a gag order? Do you know I can't even talk about it right now? Do you know that I have a judge who has a gag order? He doesn't want me to talk. And the reason he doesn't want me to talk is because what I say is so devastating and so horrible for him. And, but think of it. I have a gag order. 
there's never been a politician in history. I mean, probably for any politician for a city council office. I'm the leading candidate to be president. I won virtually unanimously, and I beat everybody. The quickest, it was the quickest primary in history. There's never been one that was done so early. I had people that were very talented people, and I, I beat them by 45, 50, 60, 70, 80 points. There was never a close race. Nobody was even close. Good talent. They weren't close. And I'm running against the Democrats. So it's a two-party system, whether we like it or not. Republican, I'm the Republican, and I'm leading. But let's say I'm tied, but I'm leading. I believe I'm leading by a lot more than people think, and I believe we'll be leading by a lot more. And I have a judge who put a gag order on me. So when you ask me a question, or when you ask me a question, I can't give you an answer, because if I give the answer, they want to put you in jail. He said, we'll put him in jail if he talks beyond the gag order. And this is in a state where, the, unfortunately, the laws have been very bad, and they haven't been upheld by the appellate divisions generally. Although I have one case where we uh, judge uh, a certain judge. I won't use names, but the attorney general case where we won five appeals on the same case, the most ever trial. It was a ridiculous, horrible decision where you have a very, very biased voting population and a judge that whose hatred of Donald Trump was beyond belief. And we won the case, but he ruled a ridiculous amount of money, civil case, ruled ridiculous. Now, this is a — what they're doing is uh, interference with an election. They want to interfere. Look at the one thing they want to sentence right before the election takes place. Let's sentence him. Because who's going to vote for him if we sentence him? Let's sentence him right before — no. This is interference with a presidential election at a state level, and it's a state that always goes Democrat. It's interference. And as you know, the Supreme Court ruled recently on immunity, and I'm immune from all of this stuff that they charge me with. But isn't it a terrible thing? And yet Hillary Clinton, when it came time to make a decision, I said, I don't want to put the wife of the President of the United States in prison. I want the country to come together and to be unified. And here it is a few years later, and these people say, let's put him — why? Because I'm, I challenge an election? Because I want to challenge an election or some other reason? Uh, it's a really disgraceful thing. It's a shame. And it's a very dangerous thing for both parties, because once they start that ball rolling, once they started rolling, that's a, that's a nasty ball. Yes, please. Please. Two quick questions here. Uh, Nikki Haley told our Brett Baer that Republicans need to stop whining about Kamala Harris, focus on courting those independents, those suburban women, the moderates out there. What do you think of that strategy? And would you consider having Nikki Haley on the campaign trail with you? Sure. Uh, I think that we've done very well. I think that we're hitting a nerve. I think this is a different kind of a race. All we have to do is define our opponent as being a communist or a socialist or somebody that's going to destroy our country. Uh, you know, I, I fought Nikki very hard. I beat her in her own state by legendary numbers. Uh, and I get along with her fine. I appreciate that she endorsed me and all of that. Uh, no, I think that uh, — I think relatively to what they're doing and how radical they are and how, in many ways, how sick they are, I think I'm doing a very calm campaign. I mean, we're here. There's no shouting. Now, you'll say, he ranted and raved. Not you, but some of you will say, he ranted and raved. I didn't rant and rave. I'm a very calm person, believe it or not. If I wasn't, I uh, probably wouldn't be around anymore, you know? Probably wouldn't be around. But no, I think uh, I appreciate her advice. Uh, I have to do it my way. You know, I ran against her, and I did it my way. People said I should maybe do it a different way, but I won in South Carolina by numbers that nobody's ever seen before, you know, wasn't even close. And, and I think she's a good woman. I'd love to have her support. Yeah, she, give me, she gave me support, but I'd love to have her go around and campaign. Quick follow-up on the economy. You mentioned this in your remarks. Vice President Kamala Harris wants to put a ban on price gouging. Do you think that the federal government is, should be responsible for determining food prices? Well, not only responsible, they probably can't do it legally, and that will drive up prices. Uh, she wants no fracking. Now, she may go and change that. I think she's already changed it. 
but she wants to have no fracking. I want no fracking. But for her whole life, she said that, no fracking. Then about, I don't know when, a couple of months ago, all of a sudden, when she started looking at polls, remember this, she all of a sudden says fracking. I don't think any, the, I, I won Pennsylvania, and I did much better the second time. I won it in 2016, did much better the second time. I know Pennsylvania very well. I don't think there's any way in hell that somebody that's intelligent living in Pennsylvania is going to vote for somebody that basically will eventually end fracking, end fossil fuel. So whether it's Oklahoma or Texas... Okay, you've been listening to former President Donald Trump take questions from reporters. Uh, among other things, he was asked about his relationship with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He claimed that October 7th, the attack by Hamas on Israel, would never have happened if he was president. Uh, he was asked about his assassination attempt. He said he did think that God had something to do with it. Maybe God wants me to save the world. Uh, he was asked about credit card debt. He uh, He's been encouraged by Republicans to stay more focused on the economy. Uh, he said that he will fix the problem if he is elected. He didn't give a lot or any details about how he would do that. Um, and uh, most interestingly, he was asked about uh, some of the pleas from Republicans for him to stop personally attacking Kamala Harris, and he said, and I quote, I think I'm entitled to personal attacks, unquote, because Kamala Harris has called him and his running mate weird. Uh, I want to bring in now Democratic strategist and Joel Payne and Republican strategist Matt Gorman to discuss everything we've been hearing. We have heard a lot. So uh, just, you know, right off the top, tell me about some of your thoughts. Matt, is this uh, going to reassure uh, Republicans throughout the party who have been saying you need to stay laser focused on the economy? He tried, you know. Uh, it wasn't certainly what we, I think, always Nikki Haley would, would want. But, uh, you know, you saw him trying to make some comments there. He had groceries all around him. But as he said it, he put it well. He's not going to change. He's 78 years old. You expect mm -hmm. him to change. It's not going to happen. So it's a matter of, okay, how many, how much, how much can you peel off of folks that are already kind of going for Kamala? Or can you win them back? And what can you do with independence? He can't help himself. He spent maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes of that conversation on some message talking about the economy, trying to frame Kamala Harris. He got questions. He maybe spent 20, 30 seconds of the answers somewhat on message, and then he riffed for 10 minutes after. And he did it question after question after question. That's a microcosm of the election right now. If Donald Trump is not able to exhibit more message discipline, Kamala Harris and Democrats are going to be able to continue to tell a story that the American people want to hear unchallenged. Right now, that Donald Trump is not going to win an election. What we heard over and over from him today was Kamala Harris is a socialist. She's a communist. She's worse than a communist. She wants to take us to Soviet policies or Venezuelan policies. Is that something that can stick, or is it so over the top that people will just laugh it off? We use socialists and, and that sort of thing when, when I was at the NRCC <clears throat> with, with Candace Town Bell. Like, I, I don't think that hyperbole is actually, you know, totally, totally uh, out, of, out of bounds. Um, oh, because I think there's a difference between hyperbole and puffery and personal attacks, right? right. Like one, one is unproductive, right? The personal stuff, but, but she's obviously like, not wait. a communist. Yeah, I know, but it's not. It's hyperbole. Like it's like obviously, like you know, like the fate of democracy, you know, lying in this. Like we we use political argument and hyperbole to boost that. So okay. I, that I'm okay with a little bit. Um, it's it's when you kind of get into some other things that I think makes a lot of Republicans, from Kevin McCarthy to Vivek Ramaswamy to Nikki Haley, a little uneasy. I think it's the style, right? It reminds mm -hmm. people, I think, of the less focused Trump. Um, the Trump before, in 2016, before his campaign had the, what, fifth reset, where they finally got focused on an economic populist message. It reminds people of the 2020 Trump and the post-2020 Trump, who denied the election and who has spent time attacking recently Brian Kemp in Georgia in a state that he needs. I think that's really what it probably signals to, I would imagine, some Republicans and to independents who the Kamala Harris message of future-facing, uh, looking forward, joy, really appeals to those folks who want to turn the page on this era of politics. Donald Trump plays right into that. Speaking of joy, uh, Kamala Harris and her running mate, uh um, Tim Waltz appeared to try to do a bit of counter-programming today. Yeah. They knew that this press conference was coming, so they released a video of their own of the two of them 
just kind of chewing the fat, talking to each other about issues, but also just about their personal lives as well, and they released that. So let's take a look at some of that and then talk about it. I called you, Tim. I was hoping you, maybe we wouldn't have to. I called you, Tim. <laughs> yes. You didn't answer, Tim. I know, I know. The, uh, <laughs> what happened? The most important call of my life, it popped up, and we didn't recognize the uh, the caller ID, and it went to, uh, it went to voicemail. Hi, this is Jim. I'm not able to answer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Tim, it's Kamala. I really want to talk to you. <laughs> So it seems like the goal here is to send a message, we're friends and we're happy. Yeah, here's the thing, Nancy. You don't have to agree with Kamala Harris on economic policy. You don't have to agree with her on foreign policy. You don't have to agree with Tim Walz's record in Minnesota to, to see that those are two people who enjoy spending time together, who have personal chemistry, and who I think have a, a comedy towards each other that I think this country will respond well to it. Does not mean they're gonna win the election, but it does mean that that is a different conversation than the one we witnessed from Bedminster a few minutes ago. And I'd imagine that the folks who are running the Harris campaign wanna counter-program what you're hearing from the Trump campaign with that. Vibes alone can't win an election, but it can go far to change the atmospherics around an election. How worried are Republicans about the vibes? I worry about the policies and the polls a little more. Vibes don't vote. Um, but what I will say is, like, look, I, I worry about the message and, the, and, and how are you kind of coming across. And right, I think, look, we, we expect Kamala to have a very good week next week, as people tend to do coming out of convention. We did. But then once that happens, right, you're almost at Labor Day. You're at almost the first uh, the debate between Harris and Trump. How can you fundamentally change dynamics? And how can you maybe, hopefully, make a case against Harris with likely she'll have a couple point lead, most likely coming out of the convention? We did learn one very interesting fact from former President Trump in this press conference. He was asked about his hiring, rehiring, I guess, of Corey Lewandowski, and he said that Lewandowski's role is going to be, quote, a personal envoy at some level. What is that? I, it's me. <laughs> um, but uh, look, I, but what I also noticed before that, I think it was important, and I'm, I'm glad he did it. He did reassert, though, that, like, um, Corey wasn't coming in to say layer over. Chris and Susie, uh, who are the co-campaign managers, Chris Lazzavita and Susie Wiles, he kind of reaffirmed their stature in the organization. Look, this has been a very well-run campaign, his best of the three. They're obviously uh, on their heels a little bit right now. But, you know, again, I think having them at the top does help with a little bit of discipline organization-wide. I've mentioned joy before. There's a lot of joy in Democratic circles that Corey Lewandowski is near the helms of the Trump uh, campaign right now. Um, I think that influence on Donald Trump feeds his worst instincts and is a bad one and is one that Democrats will be happy to go against for the next 80 some odd days. His mantra is let Trump be Trump. Yeah. And I think whether Corey Lewis was in the organization or not, Trump is 78 years old. You're not going to change him all of a sudden. Fair enough. Well, Joe Joel Payne, uh, Matt Gorman, thank you so much for sticking around to discuss that press conference with me. I really appreciate it.